It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cody Andrews, who has recently come back to Michigan after doing a fellowship in uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation, specifically focused in cancer at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Fesher. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lau, both for organizing all of this and inviting me to speak today. Um, so I just briefly overview what we'll talk about today. So, you know, let's start with what is physical medicine rehabilitation. A lot of people don't know, a lot of physicians don't know, patients don't know that we exist. We're a pretty small specialty. And then kind of delineating, you know, what can we do for cancer patients specifically, because that's um, what my training is in and that's what I am passionate about. Um, so, you know, physical medicine rehabilitation, we're also called PM and R, um, physiatry or physiatry if you're from the Midwest, um, rehab, so we go by lots of different names. So if you hear any of these thrown about, these all mean us. Um, this is a very, you know, busy slide to kind of talk about what we are, but this is straight from our academy website. Our job is basically to restore function in people who have lost it. Um, typical patient populations that we see are people with brain injuries or spinal cord injuries, um, amputations, strokes, uh, children with cerebral palsy. Um, so people who have had something happen to their life um, and have lost a component of their function and quality of life because of that. Um, we work with them to restore the function and quality of life that we can and adapt to that which we can't. Um, we also work in a very team-based setting. I don't do this by myself. Um, I have physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech and language pathologists, nurses. I, I work with a large comprehensive team, and that's a big part of our training. And then there's been a lot of emphasis recently in my field into branching out into oncology patients. Um, people with cancer are living longer nowadays. We have better treatments, we have better surgeries, we have better radiation techniques. Um, new medicines are coming out all of the time, so people are living longer, and there's been a lot more emphasis placed on, you know, what a patient's life experience is as they go through cancer. What is, you know, we're doing everything we can to treat the cancer and to do the right surgeries to, you know, give them the right medicines. Um, but, but what about the other things that we're missing? Your quality of life, um, your function, your ability to work, your ability to enjoy your life. Um, so in an effort to kind of expand this and to make sure that we're capturing all those things that we've missed historically, um, the Commission on Cancer, um, which is something from the American College of Surgeons, has actually like said that to be a, a cancer center, you really need to have access to rehabilitation services. They're kind of vague on what that means, but you, you, we really need to be paying attention to this. And so that's where my field is trying to step in and fill that gap. Um, we focus on a variety of different um, symptoms and side effects that people might have, neuropathy, nerve damage, any kind of pain, lymphedema, which our surgical colleagues talked about earlier, just general strength and physical conditioning, fatigue, which Dr. Zick um, just went over, um, cognitive side effects, so if you have chemotherapy and you're just feeling foggy from that, um, these are the kind of side effects, and anything else um, on here. Uh, that's not on here. We, we treat many, many different kinds of symptoms. Um, just to kind of give you an overview of um, where we are here at Michigan. So at Michigan, we're fortunate. Um, my department here, um, our chair is very excited about expanding um, into more cancer patients. Um, I recently joined this year after coming back, as um, Dr. Fesher mentioned. Um, I was trained by Dr. Sean Smith, who probably some of you here have seen. Um, in his clinic. Um, so he and I basically do the same kind of treatments. And we also have a colleague, um, Dr. Sarah Money, who's the one on the right. She does more interventional procedures. So if somebody needs injections under x-ray machines, we have, that, we have somebody who um, really wants to focus on doing that for cancer patients. We have lots of people who do injections in my department, but she really is interested in um, developing treatments for people with cancer. So I'm going to use that as kind of a segue. I want to see if, I don't know if this is going to work or not, probably. So I, I want to talk about, you know, what we can do for you guys. And I want to, um, this is a gentleman. He's a YouTube vlogger. Um, and you get nauseous. And you, you feel like you're going to throw up, but you don't because there's nothing to throw up. And it's just this really weird thing. And I'm sorry if this is kind of gross and like depressing, but 
I think it's important to share the realities of this with you. He was a vlogger before he was diagnosed with cancer. Um, so he was making um, these videos online um, about, you know, just random stuff. Um, it, he's kind of like sciencey videos and things like that. Um, and then he was diagnosed with a sarcoma in his leg. Um, after that, um, he really focused a lot of his YouTube experience into describing his experience um, with cancer and its treatments. Um, so uh, the video is called um, An Off Day, and he really goes into depth about just talking about like the fatigue that Dr. Isik was talking about. Just he feels bad. He feels just exhausted. It's not necessarily that he's sleepy or tired or not sleeping well, but it's describing the experience that so many of my patients have expressed to me. The reason I wanted to show the video is I feel like he does a better job than me as a physician telling you what you are feeling as patients. Um, but it's just this like general malaise. You don't want to do anything. You're scared. Um, you're tired. You don't know how to talk about the feelings that you're having. Um, you have pain that, you know, maybe isn't being treated or is difficult to manage. Um, just all of these different things that can really impact your quality of life. And so this survivorship model is really a continuum of caring for all of those different things. And it, incorpor it definitely incorporates cancer and its treatments and surveillance if um, you're no evidence of disease. You know, it's important to surveil and make sure that it isn't coming back. But there's so much to treating cancer other than that that we're beginning to realize. This is an extremely busy slide, and I apologize for that. But this is um, from one of my colleagues at Harvard, uh, Dr. Julie Silver. Um, so there's a melanoma column, and it's just basically like lining out like what symptoms melanoma patients often experience. You can see that you know the melanoma column is you know quite full. So just general physical things like fatigue, musculoskeletal pain, neuropathic pain, specific things like back pain, um, problems with walking. Um, this goes on and on for a long time, but it just, it shows that, you know, everybody with melanoma might have different kind of side effects. Everybody might have a different experience with melanoma, but all of these things can interfere with your quality of life and your function and your ability to live your life the way that you want. Um, there's a lot of different things that we can do for people of all kinds of cancer, but melanoma, I mean, we can give you adaptive equipment if you need it. Um, durable medical equipment like, you know, uh, walkers, canes, things like that if you need them, um, ankle braces. Um, we can help you get back into the workplace. I'm going to get a little bit more into that later. Um, as Dr. Zick mentioned earlier, um, exercise is really important for everybody. Um, we all should exercise. We all should be active. Um, but it really can help with cancer and its side effects. And there have been studies that have shown that. It improves the sense of well-being. It can improve mortality and quality of life. Um, but it can be very difficult to initiate. If you're feeling fatigued and you don't, you're just exhausted, you have anxiety about the cancer or it coming back, it's hard to initiate that kind of thing. You also don't know, like, am I medically able to do this? Like, I just was treated for cancer. Is it safe for me to start an exercise program? Like a, a lot of people like have chemotherapy side effects or radiation side effects that really they need their return or their initiation of exercise to be guided by a physician. Um, the American College of Sports Medicine recommends you know two and a half hours a week of you know moderate intensity exercise or an hour and a quarter a week of heavy intensity exercise for cancer patients. This is for cancer patients specifically. They also recommend resistance exercises, so exercises with weights to maintain physical function. But again, that can be difficult to initiate, especially after you've gone through cancer and its treatments. So, um, you know, fatigue is the number one complaint among cancer patients. If you, there have been many studies that show, um, you know, it's not pain, it's not anxiety, it really is fatigue is what people complain of most often and what they really are experiencing as impacting their quality of life. And physical activity is the best treatment for this. Um, di there are dietary options available, obviously. There's pharmacologic agents available that are kind of a last resort if it's really interfering with your quality of life. But, you know, these are things that we can do for people who are experiencing fatigue. Um, pain, it can be very multifactorial, you know, it can be from chemotherapy, it can be from immunotherapy, it can be from surgery, it can be from a pain that's not related to your cancer. 
Um, if you have knee arthritis, uh, I've seen a lot of patients who, um, once they're diagnosed with cancer, their just general aches and pains that they were dealing with before become a lot harder to deal with because suddenly now, instead of just dealing with the knee pain from your knee arthritis, you're, so much mental energy is devoted to dealing with um, living with cancer or living after cancer that it just makes it harder to deal with everything that you were dealing with before. Again, physical activity can help. Um, there's medications, of course, but a physician, you know, to help guide you in that is what we offer. Weakness, again, this can be from nerve damage. Um, it can be from deconditioning, post-surgical effects. Um, it can decrease quality of life, independence, and function. We have lots of tools to help with this. So from physical therapy, I mentioned I'm in a team setting, so I work very closely with physical therapists, occupational therapists. Equipment, if you need braces or adaptive equipment to help with certain tasks, like washing yourself, um, getting out of bed, transferring from your bed into a chair, um, we have those tools and assessments available for people. Um, our surgical colleagues mentioned um, the development of lymphedema is um, of significance. You know, we want to make sure that we aggressively treat this. It increases infection risk, it can lead to nerve damage, it can lead to decreased motion in the affected limbs. Um, so lymphedema is something that, you know, we manage very aggressively. The, you know, it's important for you to work with somebody who can teach you how to manage your lymphedema and give you the appropriate tools to do so at home. Um, and that can be in the form of garments, you know, that can be in the form of machines that help, you know, keep the fluid out of the extremity. But the earlier and better we can control lymphedema, the easier it is to manage in the long term. Because especially if you've had lymph node surgery, this is really a lifelong process. You're always going to be at risk for lymphedema. And so knowing how to manage that at home yourself and with your family and family members um, is going to be very important. Cognitive effects. And this is, I, I, this is very broad. Um, there's, you know, I, I spoke earlier about anxiety, I was um, actually texting a friend this morning who um, is a melanoma survivor, and she asked me if I was going to mention, you know, fear of sun avoidance as a barrier to physical activity, and I was like, no, I never even thought of that. Like, that's, I, I, I can't believe I hadn't thought of that, but she was like, you know, after I was diagnosed, I wanted to be physically active, I knew it was important, but I was just scared to go outside and go into the sun, um, and so, you know, that is a cognitive effect because of that anxiety that that can give you. And we're here to help with that, to give you tools and information about, you know, appropriate sun protection. It can also be from chemotherapy. So chemotherapy agents, you know, chemo brain, as it's called nowadays, um, just this kind of general mental fog that a lot of people undergoing cancer treatment um, experience. Um, you know, we have a variety of, like, testing to help out with this, to help kind of figure out what exactly is going on. Um, and then we have, you know, our occupational therapists who can help with this. We have neuropsychologists who can help with this. We have a lot of, we have a team of people that can really help with these kind of um, cognitive effects and, you know, just the general sense of well-being that people have after uh, cancer treatment. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about that, um, that is really important after cancer is returning to work and returning to not only work, but return to work, return to play, return to living your life after cancer. There's a lot of studies that show um, that in the general cancer patient population, those who are able to return to work if they were working before or return to their hobbies, return to the things that they were doing before they had cancer, quality of life is better, um, mortality is better, everything is, you know, if we can get you back into the workplace or, you know, back into the things that you were doing before, um, the outcomes are better. But there's a lot of barriers to that. Um, people are afraid of telling their bosses and their coworkers that they have cancer. They feel like, you know, am I going to face discrimination in the workplace? Um, am I going to lose my job? Because they don't want somebody who's going to have to be out for cancer treatment. Um, will they make appropriate adaptations to my workspace if I need it? Will they adapt my work duties if I need it? If you have uh, if you're on chemotherapy and you're not able to concentrate very well and you need frequent breaks at work, you know, how, how do you get your employer to give you that? Um, you know, these are, these are difficult questions and difficult things for somebody undergoing cancer treatment to deal with, um, and that's where we can step in um, to help, you know, to help deal with that. Um, 
So th that's just kind of a um, snapshot into what my specialty can do, what's important from our end. You know, I, I'm not a oncologist. I work very closely with my oncology colleagues um, to manage these things and to help manage side effects. Um, so um, I'll be around later afterwards if anybody has any questions, and um, I'll turn it over to the next speaker.